A disheveled, gray-haired, bespeckled man stoops over something bubbling. A frothy tube full of something he thinks will be the next big discovery that'll change the world. This is the image a lot of us have in our minds when we think mad scientist. It's a trope that's been around since the 1800s. At first, romantics looked at genius as a kind of mystical phenomenon that was outside comprehension. Then, a few decades later, genius was equated with insanity, and insanity as a kind of degenerative brain disorder. Maybe now we look at it as something in between the two. There can be a fine line between genius, craziness, and downright evil, though. And a lot of scientists throughout history have walked that line pretty precariously, with some of them falling over onto the dark side. Here are some of the craziest and downright evil scientists in history. Tycho Brahe Tycho Brahe was pretty much as mad as mad scientists could get. He made some significant contributions to astronomy, including paving the way for a heliocentric model of the solar system and some of the most accurate celestial observations in history up until that point. But he also had a pet moose he liked to get drunk. His best friend was a dwarf he thought could predict the future, and he lost the tip of his nose in a duel over math and apparently died from holding his pee into for too long at a party. What a guy! Brahe was born into a wealthy Danish family in 1546 and soon became interested in astronomy and started making his own observations of the night sky. In 1572, he found a bright new star, which he showed to be located far beyond the moon and other known celestial bodies. The discovery helped to undermine the Aristotelian belief that the heavens were unchanging and perfect and led to a new era in astronomical study. But let's get to the mad stuff. In 1566, when he was just 20 years old, Brahe got into an argument with another Danish mathematician named Mandura Parsbjerg while they were studying at university. The beef was apparently about a mathematical calculation that Brahe thought his classmate had stolen from him. The disagreement escalated to the point where the two men agreed to settle their differences with a good old-fashioned duel. The duel took place on the island of Venn, which Brahe later made into his home and base for his astronomical observations. The duel was reportedly fought with swords, and during the course of the fight, Parsbjerg swung his blade and sliced off the tip of Brahe's nose. But Brahe persevered, and he was able to finish the fight and emerge victorious despite his injury. Now, after the duel, Brahe had a replacement nose made of some kind of precious metal, like either brass or silver or gold. He also reportedly wore a prosthetic nose made of wax or paste for the rest of his life. This artificial nose was said to be pretty lifelike, but it's not clear how well it actually worked as a replacement for the real thing. Most people still think the sun revolved around the Earth, and replacement nose tech was probably pretty limited. Then there's Brahe's 800-pound moose, Rudolph. Rudolph was apparently very fond of beer and wine, and he would often drink to excess at parties that the Danish astronomer liked to throw at his castle. There are even stories of the moose over-imbibing, becoming belligerent, and attacking guests. That Rudy the moose was an angry drunk. And then there's Brahe's best friend and court jester, Jep, who could apparently predict the future. Brahe first met Jep in 1569 when the jester was just a young boy. Brahe was fascinated by the dwarf's intelligence and sense of humor, and he took Jep into his household as a court jester. Jep quickly became a close friend of Brahe and accompanied him on a lot of his travels and scientific expeditions. Jep's purported ability to see the future made him a pretty popular figure at court, and lots of people came to him for advice and guidance. Some reports suggest that Jep was able to predict the deaths of several prominent individuals, including the Duke of Brunswick and one of Brahe's own relatives. Brahe's time on Earth wouldn't be long, though. When he was 54, he apparently held his urine in for too long at a banquet and developed a fatal bladder infection. So if you have to go now, go. I'll wait. The Angel of Death It's time now to descend into the dark, depraved depths of the human soul. There have been some scientists throughout history that are just downright evil and whose scientific contributions have often been literally stained with the blood of others. One of the most notorious was the German soldier, physician, and SS officer Joseph Mengele, who picked up the nickname the Angel of Death thanks to his horrible experiments during World War II at Auschwitz. Mengele started conducting his depraved experiments at Auschwitz in 1943 when he applied for a transfer there and was eventually appointed chief medical officer. 
His experiments involved subjects of all ages, and they were often performed without anesthesia or regard for the subject's pain. He conducted experiments on twins to study genetic similarities and differences, often taking the life of one twin in order to perform post-mortem comparisons. Some of the most brutal things he did involved bone and muscle experiments, where he tried to grow bone and muscle tissue outside of the body. He'd remove limbs from living prisoners and attempt to cultivate tissue in a lab setting, which often quite resulted in extreme pain and infection. Mengele's actions weren't just sick and unethical, they were also unscientific. His experiments were poorly designed and lacked proper controls, which rendered them basically useless for advancing any kind of actual medical knowledge. The true motives for his experiments are still debated, with some suggesting that he was genuinely interested in advancing science and others claiming that he simply enjoyed the power he wielded over his subjects. After the war, Mengele fled to South America and continued to evade capture for years. He died in Brazil in 1979 without ever facing justice for his crimes. Dr. Human Z One of the weirdest scientists in history really, really wanted to create a human-chimpanzee hybrid and was bankrolled by the Soviet government to try and make that happen. Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov was a Soviet biologist who made quite a few attempts to create hybrid animals. He crossbred a zebra and a donkey to create a zonkey. He mixed an antelope and a cow to create an antow. A guinea pig with a rabbit to create a, a, a guinea rabbit. But things got weirder when he started fixating on mixing up a human and a chimpanzee, also known as a human Z or humanzy. Ivanov actually began his career studying the reproductive biology of horses and later became interested in artificial insemination and hybridization. In the 1920s, Ivanov was tasked by the Soviet government to use his expertise to improve agriculture through hybridization experiments. But Ivanov was really just interested in mixing up animals and humans. He also had a personal interest in creating hybrids, and he saw the opportunity to work with the Soviet government as a way to fund his more controversial experiments. In 1924, Ivanov traveled to Africa to collect chimpanzee semen and conduct artificial insemination experiments. Ivanov's obsession with creating a human Z was rooted in his belief that humans and chimpanzees were closely related and could therefore produce offspring. He hoped that this kind of hybrid would give valuable insights into human evolution and the origins of human intelligence. There's also been a lot of speculation about why Ivanov and the Soviets wanted a human Z or human Z so badly. One theory is that Ivanov thought a human-chimpanzee hybrid could be used for manual labor in tropical climates. At the time, many European countries had colonies in Africa and Asia, and the exploitation of these colonies relied heavily on manual labor. A human-ape hybrid could be seen as a solution to the problem of finding enough workers without the pesky problem of them dying from tropical diseases or being overworked. Things turned sour between Ivanov and the Soviets, though. In 1930, Ivanov was arrested by Soviet authorities and charged with participating in a conspiracy to use science to undermine the government. He was eventually sent to a labor camp where he died in 1932. Tesla's Pigeons Nikola Tesla might have been one of the best math scientists in history. Crazy haircut aside, Tesla had some quirks that ran the gamut from cute to downright weird. First off, Tesla was obsessed with the number three. He thought the number three had mystical properties and reportedly believed that if he could achieve things in sets of three, he would be more successful. The case in point for Tesla's obsession with three was his invention of the Tesla coil, which used a series of three coils to produce high voltage, high frequency electrical energy. He believed that this was the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe and that it held huge potential for wireless communication. Tesla also had obsessive compulsive disorder, which included a fear of germs and a need for things to be arranged in precise patterns. He apparently had a strict daily routine that included walking to his laboratory at the same time every day, and he never ate at restaurants. Tesla was also into pigeons. I mean, really into pigeons. Tesla's fascination with pigeons apparently started when he was living in New York City during the 1890s. On a regular basis, he would regularly feed and care for the birds and was known to have been particularly attracted to a white pigeon that he claimed visited him every day. Oh, he had a type. In a 1929 interview with Time Magazine, Tesla said of the pigeon, I love that pigeon as a man loves a woman, and she loved me. As long as I had her, there was a purpose to my life. Okay. Tesla had apparently found his soulmate, but it's too bad the average lifespan of a pigeon is only six years. 
Luckily for Tesla, he didn't make it long enough to see the recent birds aren't real trend on social media either. Paracelsus If you think Paracelsus sounds like the name of some Greek philosopher or scientist, you're right, but he's not. Paracelsus' real name was Deep Breath, Philippus Areolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. Heck of a name, a mouthful, so it's no surprise that he wanted something a little more wieldy. Honestly, I'd like to call him Dr. Bombastus, but unfortunately the history books don't remember him by that name. Oh, also, he wasn't Greek, he was Swiss and he lived from 1493 to 1541, and he wasn't buddies with Aristotle. Paracelsus reportedly chose his name because of his belief in transmutation, the idea that one substance could be transformed into another, aka alchemy. The name Paracelsus is actually derived from the Greek word para meaning beyond and kelsos meaning measure. It's thought that Paracelsus chose his name to emphasize his belief in the importance of going beyond traditional methods of medicine and chemistry and instead relying on observation, experimentation, and natural remedies. Paracelsus was known for his rejection of traditional teachings, but he also kind of Paracelsus sucked. He reportedly had a pretty abrasive personality and was known to get into it with anyone who disagreed with him. In short, he was a scientist. But let's get more into his thoughts on alchemy. Paracelsus' understanding of transmutation was different from that of other alchemists of his time. He thought that transmutation wasn't just a matter of turning base metals into gold or silver and getting filthy rich from it. He saw it more as a process of transformation that could take place on multiple levels, including physical, psychological, and spiritual. He believed that the alchemical process could be used to transform not only metals but also plants, animals, and even human beings. Paracelsus' understanding of transmutation was closely tied to his belief in the interconnectedness of all things in the natural world. He believed that everything in the universe was connected by a network of correspondences and that these correspondences could be harnessed through the practice of alchemy to affect transformations on all levels of being. Sounds nice right? But probably one of the craziest things about Dr. Bombastus was the fact that he really wanted to use alchemical transmutation to create something called a homunculi, basically small humans. According to Paracelsus, the process of creating homunculus involved taking semen and placing it in a special container along with other substances such as animal or plant material and then subjecting the mixture to a series of alchemical processes. Over time, a small human-like creature would form inside the container which would then need to be nurtured and fed until it grew to maturity. Paracelsus believed that homuncoli could be used for a variety of purposes, including as medical assistance or as a way to extend human life. He also believed that they could be used as a source of secret knowledge, as they were said to possess a profound understanding of the natural world. Unfortunately for him, and maybe fortunately for the rest of the world, Paracelsus was never able to achieve his little homuncoli dreams. But he did do a whole lot of other great stuff for science and medicine, he was a pioneer in the field of toxicology, introduced the concept of dose response, which basically says that the effectiveness of a drug depends on the dose that's administered, and did some great work on the connection between mental health and illness. The Real Life Dr. Frankenstein Giovanni Aldini was an Italian scientist on a mission, and it was quite a strange one. He's been dubbed the real-life Dr. Frankenstein, and for good reason. The experiments he conducted were shocking in more ways than one. Aldini believed that electricity was the key to understanding and controlling the functions of the human body, and he conducted experiments to test his theories. One of his most famous demonstrations was the electrostimulations on the limbs of dead people, which he thought could potentially bring the dead back to life. In 1803, Aldini carried out a public demonstration of his electrostimulation technique on the body of an executed criminal named George Forster at Newgate Prison in London. The demonstration involved attaching electrodes to Forster's ear and backside. Now remember, Forster was dead. The audience was shocked and horrified to see Forster's limbs twitch and move in response to the electrical current. But alas, the deceased criminal didn't rise from the dead. He just got a bit more, let's say, well done. Aldini's work was obviously controversial and drew criticism from a lot of people in the scientific community who thought he was exploiting the dead for his own personal gain. Still though, his research was groundbreaking in the sense that it helped pave the way for more studies in bioelectricity and the relationship between electricity and the human body. And then there's Frankenstein. Aldini was also the inspiration for Mary Shelley's character, Dr. Frankenstein, 
and in a pretty literal sense. Shelley apparently attended one of Aldini's public demonstrations of electrostimulation in London just a few years before writing her classic novel. Dr. UFO Shenkwa, who lived from 1031 to 1095, might not have been as eccentric as Tycho Brahe, but he did report what might be one of the first known UFO sightings in written history. Kwa did pretty much everything. He was a mathematician, astronomer, geologist, cartographer, pharmacologist, zoologist, botanist, painter, and poet during China's Song Dynasty. One of Shen Kwa's most significant contributions was the work on the compass where he described the magnetic needle compass and how it was used for navigation. He also made significant contributions to astronomy, describing the concept of the celestial sphere and developing an early form of an astronomical clock. Shenkwa also made important observations in the field of geology, describing how fossil shells were found in sedimentary rock formations and proposing the theory of gradual climate change. He also wrote extensively on medicine, including descriptions of the circulation of blood and the use of anesthesia. But one of the most fascinating aspects of Shen Kwa's life was his reported sighting of a UFO. In his book, Dream Pool Essays, Kwa described a pear-shaped object that he saw flying over the city of Yangzhou. The object was apparently as bright as a star and emitted a sound that was like a rushing wind. Kwa theorized that the object was a type of atmospheric phenomenon, but many have interpreted it as an early description of a UFO. Did Kwa want to believe that? The Tuskegee Scientist you know, one of the most sinister experiments in history occurred over the course of 40 years in Alabama. The Tuskegee Treponema Pallidum experiment was a notorious clinical study conducted by the United States Public Health Service on African American men in Tuskegee, Alabama from 1932 to 1972. The study was aimed at observing the natural progression of the untreated illness, but it was conducted without any kind of informed consent and was carried out without any actual treatment for the disease, even after penicillin became widely available in the 1940s. The study began in 1932, when United States Public Health Service researchers recruited 600 poor, mostly illiterate African-American sharecroppers from Macon County, Alabama, who were diagnosed with treponema pallidum. The men were told they were being treated for bad blood, a term used at the time to describe various ailments, including treponema pallidum, anemia, and fatigue. The researchers didn't inform the men that they were sick or even explain the purpose of the study. Instead, they were promised free medical care, meals, and burial insurance in exchange for participating. Getting burial insurance as compensation for a study isn't a good sign that the study is above board. Over the course of the study, the researchers systematically denied the men treatment, even after penicillin became widely available in the 1940s and was recognized as an effective cure for treponema pallidum. Instead, the researchers just kept monitoring the men's disease progression and performed painful and invasive tests including spinal taps and blood draws without their informed consent. The men were also prevented from seeking treatment from other healthcare providers. The Tuskegee experiment was eventually exposed by a whistleblower in 1972, which led to public outrage and a congressional investigation. The study was terminated, and the surviving participants and their families were offered medical treatment and financial compensation. But by the time the study ended, 28 men had died of the disease, 100 more had died of related complications, and at least 40 spouses and 19 children had contracted the disease. The scientists involved in the Tuskegee treponema pallidum experiment included quite a few prominent United States Public Health Service physicians and researchers, including Dr. Talaferro Clark, Dr. Raymond Vondelier, and Dr. Thomas Perrin Jr., who would later serve as the Surgeon General of the United States. The researchers justified the study by claiming that it would benefit African American communities by providing information about the natural progression of treponema pallidum and improving public health policies. But in reality, it was just an evil, no-good, downright bigot study that did a whole lot more harm than good. But at the very least, it led to some significant changes in research ethics and the regulation of clinical trials in the U.S. Shiro Ishii There was another scientist halfway around the world during World War II who was doing things that might have even made Joseph Mengele cringe. Shiro Ishii was a Japanese microbiologist who descended to the dark side a few years before Mengele, and the experiments he carried out were perhaps equally as horrible as Mengele's. And that's saying something. Ishii led the infamous Unit 731 during World War II. 
He was born in 1892 near Tokyo and studied medicine at Kyoto Imperial University before joining the Japanese Army as a medical officer in 1921. Things would quickly take a turn towards the ugly. In 1932, Ishii was assigned to the Army's Biological Warfare Unit, where he started conducting experiments on prisoners of war and civilians during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Ishii's research included operating in all kinds of twisted ways on living subjects without using anesthesia, exposing prisoners to infectious diseases like Bacillus anthracis, Yersinia pestis, and typhus. He also conducted experiments with biological weapons like miracle poison and Vibrio cholerae infection. Unit 731 was based in Harbin, China, and Ishii was basically given free reign to conduct his experiments on thousands of prisoners in whatever ways he wanted from 1937 to 1945. He thought that Japan needed to create biological weapons to achieve military supremacy, and his experiments were aimed at developing deadly strains of diseases that could be used to incapacitate enemy soldiers. At the end of World War II, Ishii and his cohorts tried their best to destroy all evidence of their work by burning documents and taking out any leftover prisoners. But despite this, Allied forces discovered the atrocities committed by Ishii in Unit 731, and Ishii was arrested in the aftermath of the war. But this microbiologist of death wriggled his way out of any real justice. In exchange for immunity from prosecution, Ishii agreed to give the United States information about his research and the biological weapons he had developed. Fritz Haber The next scientist managed to both revolutionize farming and basically create a technique that has kept the world flush with food while also creating some of the deadliest chemical weapons known to man. Fritz Haber was a German chemist who lived from 1868 to 1934. On the more positive side, he's known for what can only be described as genius contributions to the fields of physical chemistry and electrochemistry and particularly in the development of what's become known as the Haber-Bosch process for synthesizing ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. It might sound boring, but it might be one of the most important scientific discoveries in history. The process has had an incredibly profound impact on agriculture and made large-scale production of fertilizer possible, which made high-yield efficient farming possible, which helped feed a growing global population. Without Haber, we might be going through a global food crisis right now and tens of thousands, if not millions of people, might have lost their lives. Haber's work on the synthesis of ammonia earned him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1918. But his career took a dark turn during World War I, when all that chemistry he was involved in was weaponized. Haber was a big reason for the development of the chlorine gas that was used to take the lives of who knows how many thousands of soldiers in the trenches during World War I. It began to be used by German forces in 1915. Chlorine gas was a devastating and horrifying innovation that basically caused people to suffocate on their own fluids. Warfare would change forever because of it, and it resulted in the 1925 Geneva Convention that ended up officially banning chemical weapons. Despite the horrors of his wartime work, Haber still remained committed to science throughout his career. He continued to conduct research in a variety of fields, including electrochemistry and thermodynamics and atmospheric chemistry. He was also instrumental in the founding of the Kaiser Wilhelm Society for the Advancement of Science, which later became the Max Planck Society. Haber died in 1934, and his legacy remains controversial. His contributions to the development of the Haber-Bosch process have been widely recognized as transformative for agriculture and humanity in general but his involvement in the development of chemical weapons has been criticized as a moral failure. What other crazy or evil scientists do you want to know about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.